Brighton District City Councilor. Today is Thursday, May 31st. Uh, we are here from folks from budget and collections uh, regarding docket 0626 order for a hearing regarding adoption of flexible payment plans for property tax arrears. Uh, I am joined by the sponsor of that hearing order to my right, Councillor Lydia Edwards. I'd like to remind folks that this is a public hearing. It's being broadcast live and recorded on Comcast Channel 8, RCN 82, and Verizon 1964. It asks folks in the chamber to silence their electronic devices at the conclusion, or in this case, of the conclusion of the presentation from the administration, we will take public testimony and then open it up for questions uh, from myself and or the sponsor and or anybody else that joins us. Um, again, uh, I'd like to just welcome folks from the budget office and, and collections and uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Sialmo and Councillor Edwards. Um, I am Emma Handy. I'm the Chief of Administration and Finance and the Collector Treasurer for the City of Boston. I'm joined by Celia Barton, who's the First Assistant Collector Treasurer, and Gail Willett, who is the Commissioner of Assessing for the City of Boston. As you're aware, the City of Boston relies on property tax for 70% of its annual revenue. That property tax enables us to invest in our parks, our schools, our libraries, public safety, and more critical services that the city provides. Property tax revenue is critical to ensuring that the city of Boston can deliver its world-class services to its residents. We have a 99% collection rate for our property taxes, and for the past five years, the city of Boston has earned a AAA bond rating for both Moody's and S&P. One of the key factors cited by Moody's as a credit strength has been the city's high reliance on stable property tax revenues. In growth, uh, the growth in our property tax revenues and our high collection rate is seen as one of our strengths when evaluating our credit worthiness. Of the over 170,000 parcels in the city of Boston, 3% or about 5,000 are in tax title. Many of these tax title cases date back years and are the subject of lengthy and complicated land court proceedings. In the past three years, there have only been 45 foreclosure judgments. Of those, 32 were vacant land or properties, 13 of the properties were occupied properties, and of which eight were able to be redeemed by the owner and four are in the process of being redeemed by the owner. The single foreclosure since May 1st of 2015 has been on a commercial property, which was a gas station. The city has had zero foreclosure judgments on properties that the owner filed an, an answer in the land court and or contacted the city of Boston. As a point of comparison, for 2017 alone, bank foreclosures totaled 139 parcels. The, process, the processes that the city follows for the collection of property taxes are required by mass general laws, we do understand that there is a population of residents that is particularly vulnerable and may struggle with their ability to pay property taxes, particularly in this active real estate market. We're committed to working with taxpayers that, ha that have difficulty with their tax bills. We work with the tools that provide as much flexibility to the taxpayer as possible. Helping seniors retain their homes was a key component in the mayor's housing plan. The city offers interest-free home improvement loans that require zero payment until the house is sold or transferred. And the city also offers foreclosure prevention and general counseling to homeowners. Since 2014, these efforts have helped 790 homeowners stay in their homes. The city has consistently provided the maximum amount of tax relief allowed under the state classification formula, which gives the ability to tax business properties at a higher rate than homeowners. 65% of property value is classified as residential. However, the residential class only pays 39% of the city's $2.2 billion tax levy. In a sign of our further commitment to the taxpayer, Mayor Walsh has advocated at the state to increase the residential ex exemption limit from 30% to 35%, and each year the administration has recommended giving this maximum discount to residential homeowners. The residential exemption was $2,538 in FY18, which is equivalent to a property reduction of uh, $242,000. The average single family tax bill was $3,324 in FY18 for taxpayers receiving the residential exemption, which is 41% below the statewide average. The city offers a wide range of exemption programs for homeowners who are elderly, blind, surviving spouses, or minor children of deceased parents, veterans, or members of the National Guard serving overseas during the tax year. The city has also actively raised benefit amounts while broadening eligibility requirements for those programs in the past years. The elderly exemption was increased from $750 
uh, to $750 from 500 in 2010, and the eligibility age was reduced from 65 to 65 from 70, and income limits increased. The city offers a tax deferral program for those elderly taxpayers who are having difficulty paying their tax bills and are in need of assistance. In 2010, the interest rate on the deferral program was reduced to 4%. Additionally, in FY18, a tax deferral for long-term homeowners who are 55 years or older with a net tax liability that is at least 10% greater than the prior year became effective. Another tool in the city of Boston is the Senior Property Tax Workoff Program. The city has increased the workoff credit maximum for the city's Senior Property Tax Workoff Program from 1,000 to 1,500 for FY19. These tools are important, but they're often underutilized. The city's administration and finance team will be working with D&D and the Elderly Commission to develop ways that we can further improve communication and improve the tools and resources that we are providing to residents. We uh, are committed to continuing to use the data and information that we have so that we can help identify at-risk residents and trends and so that we can better educate residents on our available resources. Ultimately, we believe that adopting 62A may not be a viable solution for the, the city of Boston. It ultimately does not address the underlying issue of why a taxpayer is not able to pay their taxes. There's certainly a lot of data that the city of Boston has access to in terms of who might be struggling to pay their taxes, but at this point, we've not had enough time to understand how exactly 62A might impact folks in the city of Boston and what unintended consequences might be related to the adoption of, the, of 62A. We're concerned that by the time a taxpayer is in need in the t of the type of written tax, uh, written payment plan offered under 62A, they are already in, dire, in a dire financial situation, which makes it challenging to remain current while also paying their back taxes. We've reached out to other cities and towns like Springfield, Randolph, and Acton that have adopted 62A to understand their experiences and what positives or negatives they may have had in that experience. And our understanding is that in most instances, when taxpayers have elected to choose a 62A program, they have been unable to keep the payment plans and therefore have defaulted out of the program. If our goal is to provide taxpayers with real relief that makes economic sense, we believe uh, the best course of action will be reaching out to taxpayers earlier in the process so that we can educate them about the tools available to them and try to prevent them from reaching the point where they might need any type of payment plan. Our goal is to help the taxpayers before they reach the critical point where they become delinquent in their taxes. And as I mentioned, we have a number of tools and resources that are available to them, and we will continue to work to help residents maximize those programs and educate uh, folks who may need those programs within the city of Boston. We thank you for your time, and we look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, Emma. And we uh, were joined while you were presenting by District City Councilor Frank Baker. You want me to go right to and at this time, I'm going to take uh, the public testimony in advance. Nadine, uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Siomo and Councilors Edwards and Baker. I really appreciate this opportunity to discuss what we believe is a really important issue. My name is Nadine Cohen. I'm the managing attorney of the Consumer Rights Unit at Greater Boston Legal Services. And as you all know, we represent many low-income uh, homeowners in the city of Boston. And we have seen that low-income homeowners often experience great difficulty in paying their property taxes. Many, as has been mentioned, are, a are elder uh, and or disabled and simply do not have sufficient income to keep up with their increasing tax bills. Tax foreclosures and even the threat of a tax foreclosure really has a destabilizing effect on some of our most vulnerable residents and on the communities in which they live. Many elders and those with disabilities are house rich but cash poor. Uh, they're on limited uh, fixed incomes, and they often don't have their money, the money to pay their taxes. And as has been stated, many times are not aware of certain uh, opportunities for tax abatements and tax deferrals. In addition, um, we have seen elders, particularly those with cognitive disabilities, um, that impede their ability to understand uh, their their tax obligations. 
many times after the death of a spouse or the inheritance of property, homeowners simply don't understand what their obligations are. And um, Councillor Siomo, I had um, a client from Brighton several years ago who uh, was a developmentally disabled person, inherited the property from his parents. The tax bills came in his parents' name. He just put them aside, never paid. And we tried for a very long time to get the city to agree to some reasonable payment plan, and we couldn't. And our experience has been even when homeowners want to reach an agreement to pay their back taxes, the city requires a significant payment of 25% of the arrears up front. And um, those are payments that are beyond many of our low-income homeowners' ability. And remember, this 25% was set when taxes were way lower. Maybe they were $1,000, not $8,000. So, um, and currently, the, plan, the payment plans in Boston cannot exceed one year. And interest of 16% can accumulate on the arrears. So payment plans for these back taxes are often really prohibitive uh, for, mo for our most vulnerable residents. Uh, we have had many clients where we have tried to work with the city to extend the period of more than one year, and we have been told that the city was unable to do that and unable to waive any of the interest. However, under the state law, Mass General Laws Chapter 60, Section 62A, it specifically states that cities can extend repayment agreements to a term of up to five years and also waive up to 50% of the accrued interest. So we would strongly urge Boston to adopt these provisions and adopt more flexibility in payment plans. This would be a win-win for the city and for homeowners. Boston will get the back taxes they're owed, maybe over a longer period of time, but at least they will get them. And the low-income or disabled homeowners will have an opportunity to pay their taxes in an affordable way. Um, and the city could, if it chooses, adopt criteria for such payment plans. You could base it on income, you could base it on disability, on hardship, uh, unemployment. I believe Springfield says if you're unemployed for the past six months, you might be eligible. And um, I think the burden on the city of extending plans up to five years and waiving some of the interest is minimal, while the benefits to the homeowners are really great. And I think adopting this would be one more tool that the city could use. And I know that there are abatements and deferrals. We find many, many people don't um, really know about them. And are not aware of their eligibility for these programs. Certainly not the deferral of taxes, which would reduce the interest to 4% from 16%. And I just want to note that elders who have tax arrears are often not eligible for reverse mortgages. And we see a big problem with reverse mortgages because Many times if an elder is late on their tax payment or hospitalized, the reverse mortgage companies pay the full tax bill, even if that person were eligible for um, the homeowner's exemption or an elder or disability ex uh, abatement. So I think that there um, are a lot of problems there. So on behalf of the low-income clients of Greater Boston, legal services, we urge the council to adopt the provisions of Chapter 60, Section 62A, to allow greater flexibility, and we particularly urge extending pl payment plans uh, up to five years and reducing interest up to 50%. In addition, 
we uh, really feel that the city should introduce a home rule petition, which would reduce the requirement that um, you have to make a 25% down payment. I mean, that's really prohibitive, and, um, and it makes it virtually impossible for our low-income and elder homeowners to, who have significant arrears, and sometimes that happens, to bring their accounts current. And, I think these changes would help the city collect more taxes and allow homeowners a, a realistic opportunity to make their back tax payments. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. Um, the, uh, if I may oh, sure. introduce, um, yeah. this is Mr. Arnold Moore, who is a homeowner who unfortunately has had some difficulty paying his taxes, and he'd like to make some brief sure. comments. <clears throat> Before you begin, Mr. Moore, I'm sorry, I didn't, let me just introduce uh, City Councilor at Large, Anissa Sabi George, and District City Councilor Matt O'Malley have just joined us. Thank you. And I believe Councilor O'Malley, uh, uh, Mr. Moore, may be a uh, constituent of you yours. <laughs> Perhaps you remember my reaching out to you. I didn't sleep last night because this is a big moment for me. Pardon me if I stumble. It's okay. I'll try not to waste a minute of council time, uh, but if I rush it, I'll stumble for sure. Let me do my best. Sure. Prepared statement. Good afternoon, city councilors and fellow taxpayers all. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me to your law factory. I'm Arn Moore, very concerned citizen in this matter. I have four brief but important points I'd like you to hear from me. First, I turned 76 young this month. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I've lived, in, I've lived in and owned my home in JP since 1986. My only income totals $873 per month from both SSI and SSP. I also get some help from fuel assistance and food stamps. Nothing more except for marginal health care through Medicaid and Medicare for treating severe arthritis and osteoporosis. My home is my only property. Second, I'm not here only for the pleasure of meeting new friends, but of necessity because the city has petitioned for the foreclosure against my much loved home and also because of the impossible options the city imposes on folks like me with this outdated, exploitative, short-sighted payment plan, soon to be reformed, I trust. The city has me on its rack for tax-related billings with aggravated interest and fees going back to 2008. However, to date, under hardship and sacrifice, I've paid the city <clears throat> total of $7,525 against the principal amounts of my real estate taxes on installments since 2008, more than the principal amounts for all years not presently under Clause 18 appeal. I've relied on Clause 18 heavily over the years. They know me down there. Perhaps some of you do, too. <laughs> but I positively cannot afford the ruinous, usurious 16% interest compounding daily, 17.35% effective rate, being charged me by the assessor under the present system, which I submit is toxic and, need of, and in need of reform consistent with that achieved 
by other mass cities and towns. For same years, I've had to apply for the Clause 18 hardship relief. But I have to tell you, it's a process often made unhealthfully difficult and sometimes abusive through the assessor's office, partly due to the arbitrariness and capriciousness of the present system, which forces that office to administer two conflicting tasks to both, one, help the city raise revenue, and two, to administer effective relief under the likes of Clause 18 to the aging and the poor and the earned firm among Boston's most vulnerable homeowners, homeowners like myself. Third, I could enter into an affordable payment plan under appropriate changes under MGL 60, Section 62A being considered here today if and when available to Bostonians, notwithstanding my Clause 18 claims. Please advance this bill. Please. I'm mindful of the ancient Chinese sage who wisely reminded his, his emperor that if he wanted his subjects in harmony with his laws, first it must be possible to follow those laws. The present system is destructive and counterproductive in some grievous ways. Fourth, please be mindful of some well-placed vital reminders about the insidious effects of, daily, of exponential or daily compounding interest at 16%. As I said, an abusive 17.35% so-called effective rate. For example, in doubling time and other varieties, the starting amount is multiplied by n times in no blackboard. Uh, simple formula, natural log of n divided by 0 0.16 time, which means that, for example, if you have $5,000, that grows to $10,000 in, in only four years and four months, about. $10,000 grows to $100,000 in just under 14 years and five months. Thus, just $13,000 in interest alone will itself, interest alone, mind you, never mind the principal of the taxes. After all the taxes are paid, which I've almost done, Interest alone itself will accrue to over $318,000 in just 20 years, and I come from a long line of optimistic centenarians who don't really like to get trumped. As you deliberate, please consider all insightful meanings of Webster's and Chief Justice Marshall's dictum. The power to tax is the power to destroy. By virtue of your deliberations, by virtue of your deliberations here, know also, please, that the power to tax rightly is also the power to heal. And you have a lot of healing to do, dear city. And I'm with you. I want to do my best. I'm I am. So I say, uh, it's, uh, the tax is also the, the power to heal. I think that's uh, very important to have in mind, not just the destruction. Make it so. Please let me say thank you, Councillor Edwards, Baker, O'Malley. Uh, uh, Mark. Mark. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, he was butchering. Uh, for sponsoring. <laughs> Pardon. Of course, hi, uh, for sponsoring the hearing of this important matter, and to all for hearing me too. And thanks all for your most conscientious attention to this much needed, healthful, and overdue legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
at this point, I'm going to hand it over to the sponsor for the first line of questioning. Thank you, and thank you again for coming, and I really appreciate the work that you have done. I just wanted to um, open up with some, some points, um, again, thanking the, the, the chair for chairing this committee hearing. Um, and just go, going right into it, I, I, um, I'm honestly a little bit uh, disappointed that the city has, has already decided that it's going to be a no before really considering a lot of the options or even hearing some of the testimony about how when people have approached the city uh, on an individual basis um, where you had testified that they, when they do approach that somehow they're given relief, when their lawyers who represent the majority of low income folks have approached they're not given that relief. Um, I think this is a reasonable opt-in policy and it's been granted by our commonwealth and the opportunity we have here now is not to just adopt something wholesale but to sit down together and come up with a string of options that make paying taxes and make our taxpayers lives easier in Boston. I want to be clear, um, this is not a critique of the work that's going on. The fact that we have 99% collection, the fact that we have the high triple bond rating is a testament to your incredible efforts. It's also a testament to the efforts in D&D with the Boston Home Center and also REMS who do everything they can in many cases to prevent people from even being in the situation and of having to owe the city anything. So the city is doing an amazing job. What I had hoped is that the city would consider of all of the tools in the toolbox, that they would also offer this one as well. To those who aren't 55 and older, to those who aren't 65 and older, um, those are only two options that I heard that help people who owe the city taxes. The city is offering many ways to grant tax direct relief, as in reducing the amount, but once you find yourself in the situation that you owe the city of Boston something, we offer you two things, and you better be of a certain age and meet certain conditions to get them. And I'm asking that the city seriously consider offering a third, that we construct together that makes the most sense for Bostonians. And I, again, I'm disappointed that the comments ended on such what I think is a negative note, when I think this is the beginning of a conversation to be able to construct that. If at anything, I'd hope we walk away maybe with a commitment to form a task force to literally look at our tax policy, how our liens notifications go out, how we are telling people and directing them to resources, and then ultimately how we're making sure that when they do have uh, that notice and they do owe the city of Ta uh, Boston something, that we are there with the best options available for Bostonians. I am excited, or was, about working with you to construct that. I firmly also want to um, Note that I would also be part of or supportive of a home rule petition to reduce that initial 25% payment because I think that is beyond the cities, right? That is not set right. by the city, it's set by the state. And that's something that the city should seriously consider. Anybody trying to do right and, and, and you know, make up for their taxes should certainly be able to um, uh, come up with a reasonable down payment. So with that, I had sent over some questions in advance and so I just want to go through some of the data you do have. Um, so, in total, um, and I, some of this you already answered, but you can go ahead and answer for some of my colleagues, how much is owed in back taxes to the city of Boston? So, Councillor, first I want to respond to what you just said about um, the adoption of 62A. I think uh, what we're not prepared to do today is to say, yes, we should adopt 62A. Um, I think we but, agree but you, that there's a lot more information right. that needs to be gathered and there's more impact that needs to be understood. And so we're not in a place today where we are prepared to uh, be supportive of adopting 62A. We absolutely are interested in continuing to work with the council to understand the issues that face homeowners and what solutions might be uh, better availed to help home homeowners to be able to stay current on their taxes and to be able to stay in their homes. So I think that that is certainly a shared goal. Um, but. The specific question that was posed to us is, is adoption of 62A, and uh, we don't have enough information, and we have not had enough time to thoroughly vet what that would mean for the city of Boston. And I think we would very much like to continue those conversations about what it would mean and what the impact is, and get to the bottom of some of the very questions that you've posed to us. All right, so um, how much in terms of back taxes are owed to the city of Boston? It's 33 million in 33 tax million? title. In tax title. And how many, and do you have information on who primarily owns, owes that money? 
So we have parcel spots. information. Mm -hmm. We don't have demographic information. So you wouldn't be able to say how many seniors, how Correct. many low-income individuals, how many of any of that. Correct. Do you have, and is that because you just have a policy of not collecting information about taxpayers or? It's not part of the uh, assessment process. Okay. It's not part of the evaluation process. Oh, you don't have to play with that. <laughs> so um, you had mentioned that there was um, tax foreclosures actually implemented and pushed by the city about a total of 45 in the last three years? So uh, those are foreclosures, right. foreclosure judgments in the last, since 2015. How many, um, how many liens, as in notifications and telling people in Boston, Boston that they owe the city taxes, how many went out? Um, do you want to answer that for the last um. fiscal year? Um, 1,700? 1,700 yeah. liens. So annually. An annually. So, yeah. yep. so for the last three years, it's 1,700 times three, and I'm bad at math, so. But it's not necessarily, <laughs> not they're not necessarily unique, right? So some might be an additional component on mm -hmm. an existing property that has back, back taxes. So, the, but, the, but when I say liens, that's how many people have been given notification that they owe taxes and the liens have been assessed on their property. Correct. Correct. Right? And so it's just that the city is not pursuing them and that's why we're not having as many tax foreclosures? It's a process, mm -hmm. so um, that, that's the first part of the process is, is obviously moving the, the parcel to tax title. Celia, so, feel free to. Oh, so we put the lien on, so we send a final notice out in the summer, and we usually recoup uh, a couple of hundred payments at that time, mm -hmm. Then we place the lien in December. Um, under Mass General Laws, we don't do anything with those for six months. So they just sit, they sit in tax title for six months. We reach out to look for payments, but we wouldn't do anything else. So in general, Place we're talking about about 150,000 parcels, right, mm -hmm. that every year are paying taxes. Um, we typically end uh, the year, the fourth quarter, with something north of 10,000 demands, people who are behind on their taxes for that year. Um, the, the actual cases that move to tax title are about 1,700, so you see that sort of winnowing. Mm -hmm. um, and then the petitions filed, um, which is the actual beginning of the foreclosure process, were about 500 last year and uh, a little bit south of 300 in the two prior years. The problem with inferring anything from those numbers is that that is not a perfectly linear process. Obviously, there are things that happen over the course of that that might delay something. So it's not like you didn't pay your taxes one year, the next year you're petitioned, right? Yeah. There may be something that comes up. And so it's hard to, you know, to the point of understanding the data, it's hard mm -hmm. to actually take away from that uh, whether that is what the timing is for any one of those parcels and then take a, a sort of summary look at that. But it seems then you, they're just taking that, you said 500 last year, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people who, maybe the city is not gonna pursue tax foreclosure against mm -hmm. of that 500, you, you won't, right? But there's a lot of people who still then owe the city money, sure. right? Mm -hmm. So they're in this purgatory land. And right now the only uh, official kind of relief they have is either the two that you mentioned, which is that they're 55 or older, mm -hmm. or 65 or older. But if you don't meet that, those other conditions, then you, you have the only option, which is to pay 25%, mm -hmm. right? And pay it all off in one year. That's our payment plan currently. That's the payment plan. And so what, what I'm trying to offer mm -hmm. is another payment plan for that, mm -hmm. for those, other, those, those folks stuck in purgatory. But keep in mind that all of those aren't residential properties. True. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's commercial properties, mm -hmm. there's parking places, there's pieces land. of vacant land yep. that, you know. Did, did, you, did you manage to get the breakdown of the, those liens of commercial versus residential? So we have it for, I think, the fourth quarter demands. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's uh, probably about 50% residential. Um, but we would have to go back and, okay. and make sure that that's. that's of, the re of the residential, how many, do you know how many are owner occupied versus? So we don't have data on owner occupied, right? We know residential exemption. And so that's not a perfect yeah. match for owner occupied. Yeah. Um, but I think um, when we, go ahead, Gail. Uh, 540 was the match for the fourth quarter demands. Okay. So of 10,000. Um, demands in the fourth quarter, 540 are uh, delinquent with um, residential exemption. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and then again, again, the only payment plan available f for those folks, um, if they don't qualify for the other two, is the 25% in the one year. That's the city's yeah. official payment plan. Yeah. 
Um, so is there a particular, beyond the, so you had mentioned that 62A was considered burdensome in other cities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they would, along with having to do the payment plan option, they would also have to um, pay their current quarterly taxes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Wouldn't you have to do the same thing if you had to do it under your current payment plan? You'd have one year to do the 25% and pay off the back taxes plus still make your quarterly taxes? Sure. It's not, it's not a different construct. It's just that it continues. It doesn't present a new alternative in terms of mm -hmm. um, uh, like a deferral, for example, you aren't paying any current taxes right. if you don't elect to, right? Um, yeah, and so right. It, it is certainly still paying, staying current on your taxes as mm -hmm. well as making progress on your so payment plan. So it's consistent, actually, with what you would require for them, someone who owes back taxes anyway, which is that they'd have to be current and be on your payment plan, except this one would give them more time on that payment plan. Sure. Okay. Um, I will... So you um, oh, so we keep you busy. have your liens are issued in July. I'm sorry, your 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 petitions the petitions are issued in July at the end of the quarter. Um, the, no, the, the, uh, no, the year? December of the next fiscal year. So right now we're so closing FY title. 18. So in I December see. of calendar year 18, we would mm -hmm. so place, place a lien on those the properties. In terms of upstream communication with other agencies right now, do, do you have a system to help folks access? the resources that the city currently has available. I mean, how, what, so now someone owes taxes, the city's gonna do X to help me. Yeah. What is that? So that, primar that function primarily exists, uh, as you mentioned before, in both D&D and the Elderly Commission. Um, we are certainly interested and open to ideas about how uh, we can better coordinate with other city departments. Um, we are mindful that um, taxpayers give us their data um, for a particular reason when paying their taxes, and that may not necessarily align with the data that they, and the reason why they've given data to other departments. And so um, we want to think about ways that we can further that education and that outreach that is also being respectful of taxpayer data um, and uh, uh, the wishes of taxpayers in terms of communication and involvement in the city of Boston in, in those very questions. Okay. And then just one question for Nadine. Um, and I guess it's about the case. Um, when you are approaching the city of Boston for relief, uh, for reduction in either the 25% or for an extended payment plan, what's the number one reason that you get in response to why the city is telling you no? We have been told that the city has a policy that only allows one year for the payment and the 25%. The 25% is by statute, mm -hmm. but the one year is also prohibitive, and we've been told that's the city's policy. And I would say in the cases I've had and other people in my office have had, we've never had any uh, ability to make an exception uh, to that and even where you know there are real hardships and real uh, ways someone could pay over a longer time thank you <clears throat> yeah. um, I, I actually have a question for Nadine why why aren't you seeking the deferral since he's 72 years old or yeah. 76 <laughs> sorry I um, sometimes people don't want to accumulate all the uh, taxes on their home if they want to leave their property to relatives. In other words, yeah, those taxes Yeah, but if you're not paying your taxes, you're right. not going to have I mean, a home. <laughs> right. So I, we, we definitely suggest it to people, and it is up to each individual person right. to choose that option. And yes, the problem we see is many people just don't know about it. People right. don't understand that they're eligible right. for something well, like I, that. You know, I, I used to work for the elderly commission and you know I would suggest and if you're not already doing it before you you place a lien make sure the elderly commission knows about it maybe right. a few months or a quarter at least before the lien goes on and you know have them do the outreach maybe but I, I'm I, I don't know why you would want to do anything but the deferral program 
even the 20, the 20 even if it was a 10% down payment yeah. and 16% I interest. think there are also certain time frames, I believe, for applying for the deferrals. And if someone misses that, they're pretty Yeah, but I mean, it, frame, you'll miss so. it for a year, whereas you're, right. you're, you're, I, go, you're advocating to yeah. assume 16, at yeah. least 16% yeah. interest. Yeah. I, I think, think I think crunch that's, the numbers. I think that's an education <laughs> issue, and I agree we have recommended that the elder commission be notified mm -hmm. about the tax lien so they could reach out to people. Right. And I, the, uh, the one thing I'll, I will say is we don't we don't have that demographic information at this point. The, those are not tied to the parcels. And so, again, it is something that we certainly can look into in terms of can we can we um, line that data up to be able to answer those questions. But, mm -hmm. but again, I think we need to be very careful about using taxpayer information in a way that um, was not sought by the taxpayer initially when they when they gave us that information. Right, mm -hmm. right. But when they if they're getting a lien, I think any in, intervention right. would be even if it's not welcome, sure. it's probably incumbent on us to do that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you don't know who you're going to get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I would just say, as someone who worked for the Elderly yep. Commission, that was something that we try to do all the time. Yep. You know, uh, uh, what, what's it called? The Seniors at Risk, pro Elders at Risk. There's all kinds of great elderly programs that, you know, doesn't necessarily require the city to do it, but, you know, yep interagency collaboration maybe. That's absolutely um, something that we, we are planning to look into. Right, and just to, just an FYI, because I know Emma's pretty new, uh, myself, Steve Murphy, and Bill Linehan in February of 2015 introduced for the first time to allow the uh, exemption program to be lowered to 55. Mm -hmm. In, in an attempt, and I tell the story a lot, my sister worked out of high school, 18 years old, for Verizon until she was about 57, I think they laid her off. She had a great position with great earnings, and like many people in that age group, my age group, if you will, uh, you, you, you know, you've worked a career and you make a certain amount of money and now your skill set is no longer needed and mm -hmm. you're looking at going from 100000 to 40000 mm -hmm. And the implications on trying to pay a mortgage, support a family, all that. The 55-year-old home rule petition, which the mayor actually uh, helped sponsor, I mean, I think we should pursue that anyway. But that's an, uh, another question for another hearing. Sure. But I would, I would just urge you, Mr. Arnold, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Moore, to seriously consider the deferral program. It's certainly, you know, do the math. Like it's, it's you know, I don't know what you owe. Uh, I don't know where you live in JP. I don't know what your house is worth, but you should certainly, in addition to your lawyer, you should probably get an accountant to help you with, with some of these issues, just, just to crunch the numbers so you know you're making the most informed decision for your best interest. Let me tell you, uh, uh, Councilman Semino, uh, Mark? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. <laughs> um, my... My large accrued interest cannot be deferred because uh, it's out of it's out of date. It, in order to qualify for the deferral, it has to be uh, applied for at a certain time, right. and that was not done in my cases. But you, but when the next application period comes up, going forward. You could do it. <laughs> yes, I can, but it won't matter any, it won't matter diddly squat to my uh, squat, uh, to my survival. I think because it will. Present, I think you really need to well, talk just, to an accountant <laughs> or somebody. Well, well, I to, just told you, I did the numbers myself, and uh, I will owe uh, over $318,000 on just what I owe no, now. No, I can't, but you're can't talking be, about, uh, you were talking about the interest accrued from this program that we don't have access to. I'm mentioning the other program, the deferral program, that you don't pay any interest. Well, I, I take that back. You, you pay 4%, four percent interest, which I brought up in a, another hearing that Newton does one, just saying. 
uh, you know, maybe somewhere between one and four. Um, again, to help folks like Mr. Moore. But seriously, like, as an advocate, <laughs> as a, you know, as an advocate myself, I Ooh. would seriously urge you to look into the deferral program. This program doesn't do yep. anything yep. Well, good for you. It won't do any good. Uh, well, okay. I just, well, I just want to add that we have people that do apply for tax deferrals have that same feeling that they want to leave something to their family. Yeah. So we accept payments for anything right. that they so want to pay. So you can pay it down. So, you know, you can right. apply to for your taxes and then you Without decide Without accruing 16 percent. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So this we've got, is, we this accept to me payments is a no all brainer, but throughout <laughs> the process. So. Uh, you know, anyway. Uh, Council Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, Emma, ladies. Thanks for, for coming today. Um, so, Emma, the, the, the two pieces in 62A are, are basically we could forgive up to 50% of interest, interest. Mm -hmm. and change the, the, the terms yeah, from one year. That's the only changes in Correct. the 62A. Mm -hmm. And you say that really didn't pan out in some other t so towns. The, the, we talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Sure. The cities and towns we talked to were Springfield, Acton, and Randolph. Um, I think Springfield at one point had uh, in excess of 100 people in the program, and they now ha currently have one because everyone has um, defaulted out of the program. Um, I don't think that in meaning they defaulted, they, their house, their homes were foreclosed on. No, no, sorry, that they they were not able to keep up with the schedule of payments, and therefore the interest rate goes back to 16 percent. So they basically just sort of end up right back where they were. Um, uh, I think act in a much smaller pool of people, and basically there's relatively few people left in that program mm -hmm. as well. Um, so I, I don't think that it's, um, all of that is to say, I think t to uh, the counselor's point and to, from the points from GBLS, certainly we should be looking at what are the options on the table. Um, the information that we've got back from a cursory review of talking to a few cities and towns is that while this certainly is an option, it doesn't appear to have created sort of tangible results in providing relief for taxpayers. Um, whereas something like a deferral really does um, address that interest rate. So in 62A, if you if you choose the full 50% reduction of the interest rate, you're down to 8%, a deferral is 4%, um, and you don't have to make any payment, um, but you can elect to make payments right. so that that ultimate, ultimate balance is somewhat smaller. Yeah, you just defer and never pay your taxes and the mm -hmm. next person pays for it. Right, yeah, either you sell the property or... Defer, defer, defer. defer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, can, can we talk a little bit about, you, you said there were 45 foreclosure judgments in the last three years. How many of those went to full foreclosure? Uh, one. One, yep. okay. And, and that was foreclosure based on taxes, taxes that, that they correct. owe us. So they that's own correct. their house outright they could, mm -hmm. and, and right. one out of the 45 right. in the last And three actually years. those are not all residential properties. Um, so the one that went to foreclosure was a gas station. Um, the, I think the majority of them were, were residential properties, but ultimately it's a mix of, of the two. And, and the commercial properties, would they benefit for that from this 60A? So it depends on how you set up 62A. So the the way that the process would work is that, that um, you would adopt 62A, and then you would need to pass an ordinance to put the actual structure in place, and that's where you would decide what are the criteria that make somebody eligible for this. Um, from the cities and towns that we've talked to, there's been a mix. Some people include, some cities and towns include commercial, some exclude it. Um, uh, obviously, there's an interest in using demographic information to create that pool of people. The, um, the other component of 62A that is uh, sort of just just as it is, and, and you need to determine how it will work for your city in, or town, is that you're setting a class. 62A is very specific about anybody that is in that class is entitled to that benefit. So once you set whatever that criteria may be, whether it's the amount in tax title, um, age, disability, whatever it may be, everybody who has that criteria is eligible then for that benefit. There's not a lot of um, individual flexibility in terms of how you exercise it, um, but and, and so that has been another piece of feedback that we've heard from okay, cities and so, towns. So would, is, um, would this have to be done, like would we do the, because this is just in order for a hearing here, to mm -hmm. move this forward, this would be an ordinance or a home rule ordinance? It's a, yeah, because, sorry. Mm -hmm. because this is already passed at the state level, it's just an opt-in for us oh, to opt uh, into this payment and then, plan. So then we would, we would vote to opt-in, then we'd need to set up the structure. Correct. Okay. Um, we had talked, uh, is there... It, and I don't think there is, but I'm going to ask a question anyway. Like, so is there any sort of a trigger on, on like, when someone passes away or, or, like, is there a way that we would be able to get a trigger so we could be 
maybe more proactive for, for someone, parents die, and then a, an adult, whoever, you know, inherits, inherits that building, sometimes you're not capable of, of running a building. Is there any, do we have any triggers in place maybe or, yeah, it's all very no, much taxes. Not, yeah, it's, the it's just about value. It's not yeah. about who necessarily yeah, okay, owns okay, it. So. Okay, I get that. Um, yeah, I think I'm good. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor O'Malley, sorry. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I'm the, <laughs> la the last from, the, from this trio. Um, thank you to the author, Councillor Edwards, and, and uh, Mr. Moore, thank you for sharing your story. I apologize I was a little bit late, but... Um, I just want to make sure I understand, and, and, and I'm familiar with your story, Mr. Moore. Could Mr. Moore still, uh, if he decided, could he still opt into the uh, deferral? For the future taxes, yes. For future yeah. taxes, not mm -hmm. on what's currently he's in arrears for, but for future taxes. Correct. Okay. Well, again, I, I would defer. I know Councillor, um, the Chairman of Ways and Means, Councillor Siomo, but worked on budgets since I've been here, and um, maybe that's an opportunity you guys can talk about. I do think there's, sounds like... Addressing at least this specific case of a constituent, it sounds like there could be a, an opportunity there um, to discuss sort of the next steps that may be, may be beneficial to you. Um, we're working on the vacancy fee or vacancy hearing that, that I'm uh, holding in a couple weeks. Uh, is there concern that if we were to opt into 62A, it would could, con could conceivably uh, hinder efforts to address vacant buildings? And this is more so commercial buildings I'm talking about. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to it. It would certainly be something that we would want to look at in terms of gathering information about what the impact would be okay. about around adopting 62A. Okay. And I, I think one thing that, that I agree, and, and I, I, the onus is on all of us, I'd even say particularly members of the council, is that we do have some good services available. This, mm -hmm. this comes up. You know, not frequently, but not infrequently either, where I will hear from constituents who are dealing with a whole host of issues. Um, and I know that DND, I know that the Home Center, I know that we do have some good information. May maybe we all need to do a better job getting that information out and utilizing some of our channels to do that. Mm -hmm. But um, I just wonder if, do we, is there a sort of a central clearinghouse of information? If, if, if what, what, what would be the steps if Mr. Moore, and I'm only keep uh, calling your name, Mr. Moore, because you're seated here, if, if a constituent is dealing with uncertainty or questions or builds up, um, you know, a, d a debt that is insurmountable, what are the steps that we suggest he or she take? Does it start with elderly? Does it start with getting a caseworker? Does it start with... So I think, uh, I would guess, and um, I'll defer to the two people who are much more experts at this than I am, but I would guess that it does to some extent depend on what door you enter, right? Um, some, some folks have a relationship with D&D, some folks have a relationship with the Elderly Commission, some folks are just dealing directly with um, Celia Shop on, uh, on their tax bills. Um, uh, and I think that there is certainly room for greater coordination amongst those groups, um, in particular about trying to ascertain where the point is, um, where there might be uh, actionable data or, or at least helpful data about who might be in trouble. Um, you know, we mentioned at the beginning that uh, at the end of the fourth quarter in FY18, we have 10,000 demands. Um, that ultimately results in something like 1,700, 1,600, uh, 1600 yeah. um, liens. And so trying- And that's out of how many? 153,000 parcels. Parcels, taxable parcels. Trying to understand who of that 10,000 is truly in trouble versus mm -hmm. um, who, you know, for yeah. whatever reason mm -hmm. is having a momentary issue um, is a challenge. And yep. I think it's it's one of the pieces that we need to get a better sense of how exactly we answer that question. Okay. I'm not sure I answered your question. Yeah. No, no, I, I, it's, it's obviously a complicated issue. And I, yeah. I think we all want the same thing, mm -hmm. everyone yeah. in this room. Right, absolutely. And I, I think it, it maybe the approach may be a little bit differently. Um, and just because I was unaware of that, but just back to sort of the deferral. So a senior citizen in Boston can defer his or her property taxes for residential, provided it's their primary residence. Correct. If it's an investment property, they could not, right? It has to be private, which is, I support Correct. that. Mm -hmm. And Correct. they... Certain ages. I'm sorry? Certain ages that qualify. You, you have to be see, at least... 65. Yes, we'll see what a senior yeah. citizen's yeah, for 65. Senior, so, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> 65 plus, you can pay no property taxes 
Correct. And then when you either sell that house or transition to the next life or whatever, mm -hmm. then the uh, arrearage of taxes owed is, de is deducted from the point of sale. Correct. However, a senior who qualifies and is deferring his or her taxes could pay, you know, could pay one dollar a month or a thousand dollars a month Absolutely. that would then be applied against the taxes at Correct. the end. Yeah, we accept payments um, mm -hmm. for these deferrals. My mother was always famous. She'd pay a yeah. hundred dollars to her credit card every right. single month, and sometimes there was no balance, and she'd get a negative balance. So it's <laughs> a nice. I try to be frugal like that yep. too. Um, okay, so that's that's a. And we can weather that in this city? If, if every senior citizen were to, were to go to that, we would be able to sustain our budget at that? Well, there are income restrictions on that. Oh, so okay, fair point. 57000 okay. is the um, income restriction. Okay. So, yeah, and that's I, for a couple. So uh, um, I think that I without having done that analysis, and I would certainly want to know what that looks like, yeah. um, I think that it probably would not be a meaningful impact on... Our, our annual budget. No, I, I think that I'm not being critical, quite right. the contrary. I, sure. I think this is a great program and I appreciate sort of the steps and I do think, you know, um, I will certainly make sure as a district councilor who represents probably the highest percentage of senior citizens in the city among the nine council districts, uh, West Rocks is at a quarter percent senior citizens, um, make sure I do a better job of educating folks so that they don't right. find themselves. So that's four percent interest. So these, you still recoup all of the tax. Absolutely. So that wouldn't. Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank um, you, Mr. Chairman. Thing, like 2015, just for an example, we took we placed 1,470 liens, and already today we only have 387 still outstanding. Do any of those? When, I'm sorry. When were those placed? Um, 2015. Great. Okay. Okay. So we have outreach program with our deputy collectors. We'll call people to. Mm -hmm you know, reach out for payments and Correct. work with them. Okay. Thank you. Do any of those liens include the green tickets? Like, do you count them in there, the green ticket yeah. legislation? Yes, they do become part Sometimes. of the tax. Yes. Right, but that would go, if someone's paying their property taxes but didn't pay a violation, a house violation for some reason, that eventually goes on their property tax bill. Correct. And is, is that counted in with those liens? Yes. Like if that's just the only reason that they get, yeah? So yeah. not necessarily, I, I would think that that's probably a small number of them, but mm -hmm. that's possible. Sure, yeah. yeah. And we don't place liens for anything under $100. Right, and, so. and I guess another question I have is, do we ever investigate if say uh, a, a, a property owner um, stops paying taxes on property A. Do we look to see if he owns other properties? Yes, we do. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, and is there a different strategy for that, Celia? Like, do you say, oh, this guy's got five buildings and, you know, he's just not paying taxes on one? Is he playing yeah. games? Well, it's all about notice. Right. So the more when we see that with owners with duplicate properties, we do reach out to right. them and just to okay. see what's. You know, if there's something right. going on. Oh, and I'm sorry. So. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Mm. <laughs> sorry about that. Thank you, Councillor CMO, and thank you, Councillor Edwards, for your leadership on this issue. And i um, glad to learn as much as I can about this subject. Um, one concern or issue I had about this issue is I, I see a lot of elderly people in the city um, they worked hard their whole life. They're probably, uh, they might have a million dollar home right now that's worth a million dollars, and they probably have a pension maybe $60,000 a year, which isn't, isn't much, and they're barely, they're barely surviving. Um, I know you do have a plan, a plan for them um, to defer their property tax, but also aren't you just deferring it, that property tax onto their their children, if if their children inherit the home, um, and, and you really we're really not doing anything for that elderly couple at this time. At this time, we might be doing something for them, but um, you know, for their family, we're, we're adding some financial obligations to the family. That's that's a concern I have. 
it's true that in deferral, the property taxes are are uh, due at the sort of transfer of that property. Mm -hmm. um, so whether that is the sale of a property or uh, inheritance to you know a member of the family, um, certainly then the, the member of the family would need to pay those property taxes. Um, but that's you know been a, a, a tenant of that of that program. But what about a what about a an elderly couple that uh, that have a million dollar home right now? It's worth a million dollars. They're not millionaires, and they're they're barely able to pay their bills. They're they're looking at you know at the store. They're looking at the the cost of a, a can of soup, and they're trying to put food on their table, and they're they're struggling. Is there any way we can help that type of um, situation? Uh, yes, I was going to say they would be one of the personal exemptions, so they would be eligible for a residential exemption, which would be, over, as of last year, over $2,500 off their tax bill. Uh, if they are below a certain income level, they would be eligible for the personal exemption. Um, and then, additionally, they could defer, so they're deferring the smallest amount of taxes that they possibly can. Um, I would say the other uh, issue would be that if their children are concerned about inheriting the house, then they certainly can make some payments mm -hmm. towards the deferral, so they're not deferring the entire amount. Most likely, these, uh, this couple would have children that were of a working age that would be able to help them by making mm -hmm. payments now. I think um, uh, we talked about this earlier, um, that by making payments while in the deferral program, you're not required to make any payment, but eventually um, you could basically afford the payment that, you know, whatever it is that you're able to make, and then the, ultimately the tax bill is uh, the smallest amount possible at the time that there is that transition. Um, I also uh, probably am not the best person to speak to this, but I do think that that, that particular case is where the work of the Elderly Commission and DND um, come in to help folks um, and how they manage that and look at options outside of City of Boston programs that might help um, help those families uh, to maintain uh, their cost of living. My, my philosophy would basically be if anyone's willing to make a good faith effort of, of paying their taxes, um, you know, work with them, give them an opportunity to, mm -hmm. to, to stay in the house, um, whether they pay $50 a month or $100 mm -hmm. a month. As long as they're paying something, it's in good faith. Give them the opportunity to continue paying their taxes and give these elderly people the opportunity to mm -hmm. live in a city that they, they, helped, they helped build and they want to stay here. And, um, you know, we want to make it make it easier for them to live out their remaining years in, mm -hmm. in respect um, and dignity. And that's, that's where I'm coming from on, on this issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, yes, I just had some, some follow-up questions to make sure I was clear about how uh, things work. Um, with, the, with the, so if I'm uh, 64 and I owe $20,000 in back taxes, and then the next year I qualify for the tax deferral. The taxes that I owed before, I still have to pay, but any future taxes assessed on my property can be deferred. Correct. Correct. All right, so just making sure I understand then, for that 65-year-old, or now, new 65-year-old person, that $20,000 that they owed before, we still have only the one option of 25% down and one year of payments. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, the deferral, again, only works for future taxes going forward. So if right. you owe taxes before you enter the program, we don't offer relief for our seniors in that sense. Not until you meet the, the requirements. So there's the, the... But if you meet the requirement, mm -hmm. it's only for future taxes. Correct. It's Correct. not for anything you owed before. Yeah. Right. So again, if I, it doesn't matter how I, old I age. I can be 76, like Mr. Mm -hmm. Moore, mm -hmm. if I owed money before I entered the deferral program, I still have only one year, 16% interest, and a 25% down payment to pay. Correct. Okay. Um, and then in terms of the income to qualify for that program, I just want to make sure, because I, I think Councillor Siomo specifically asked, is it based on the $57,000, and it's specifically based on a couple, am I correct? For, for that amount, yes. For that the amount. 57 is So if I'm couple. by myself, and is it half of that amount? It's like 40, uh, I think. See. I think it's like 40 something. Oh, hold on. 30 something. Hey, 
while you're looking it's, at yeah, that, I just, I, I just, Let me find I the, just my wanted paperwork. to say that, you know, again, my work with the Elderly Commission, and I think you know this, Nadine, we have Elders at Risk, uh, a very valuable program that intervenes mm -hmm. yeah. on behalf of elders who really can't take care of themselves physically, emotionally, and or financially. Mm -hmm. So we do have those services okay. as well. Mm -hmm. Again, and I, I think I emphasize it in my opening remarks, this is not a critique on the amazing work the city has done mm -hmm. to protect people. And I worked side by side with those folks while I worked for the city mm -hmm. uh, and saw every day how much, you know, I can name them Jeff Alkins and how much mm -hmm. Donald Wright, mm -hmm. these folks who worked in the city in their departments and the folks that they worked with uh, did a lot. And mm -hmm. then down, they were almost social workers in the things that they did. Mm -hmm. We actually, I introduced Nadine Cohen to the, the REMS department on a case of a young man who was developmentally disabled and we helped to save his home. So, and I say we, meaning the city as well. Mm -hmm. um, my, while you're still looking at that other question, I just wanna make sure I had clarification on the question um, that uh, Council O'Malley had asked, that if all of the seniors had opted in for this program, how impactful would it be? And I thought I heard you say that it would not be so because they're ultimately paying their property taxes, the, the, oh, I see. the you portion of the property tax, point. right. The right. 4 percent is the interest that's accruing. Right. Yeah. And yeah. you would recoup it anyway. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. That's yeah. what I want to make clear. So, and I'm just waiting on the call okay. answer. But if you, if you. And no, wait, I'm sorry. I don't have that form with me. Can, um, and I just have my notes for the 57. Yeah, that's fine. The assessing department and it has under the exemption if he can probably yeah. look it up. Um, so. I would just, I, I, you know, I really do look forward to working with you. Um, I do think that there, a, a payment option, a payment plan option should be available. We can offer another one, and I look forward uh, to figuring out what the best one for Bostonians is. If 62A didn't work in other cities, I don't think amongst all of us the brain power that we have in this room that we can't come up with the best option um, for Bostonians. And so I hope that we have that commitment. Um, I don't know if it's a task force we want to set up or just to regularly talk, not only about the payment plan option, but the disbursement of information, um, whether the district counselors need to take up that and put it out there to our constituents in our own newsletters, but mm -hmm. making sure that we are part of the team mm -hmm. of getting out as much information to Bostonians and not just, just relying on the city to do that as well. I, I want to echo um, Councilor Edwards' praise of Jeff Alkins, and I, yeah. I think the one foreclosure you mentioned was in my district, mm -hmm. and I know that I worked very closely with Jeff, and we just couldn't get this person to avail herself, and it went to foreclosure. It's a sad thing, but yeah. you know you, uh, the old saying: you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, right? right? Um, so, in that in that case, I know how determined Jeff was. Mm -hmm. I mean, he went out there, we went out there, mm -hmm. and sometimes people, you know, have the right to Just refuse to help, I guess, yeah. right, yeah. right. Anyway. That, that's the elderly exemption. This, which one were we asking about? The exactly. deferral. The elderly deferral. The deferral. I think that the deferral is just the 57. I think it's that the elderly say. exemption is, is, is the single two? versus okay. the married, but so, that's right. the um, My, so, 17D. Right. My notes say income cannot exceed 57,000. doesn't mention individual or so couple okay. level. Okay. Combined. I know. Yeah. We just, yeah. we'll work on that and figure right. that out. I would just say, I don't know when that um, program, the loan repayment program was mm -hmm. implemented at the state level. It mm -hmm. seems like it probably was a long time ago when mm -hmm. interest rates, you know, really, well, mm -hmm. 2000. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that the 16% is kind of excessive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and again, I know that's state, that's right? State, well, state right. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, if no one else has anything further, uh, we just would like to submit sure. our written thank testimony. You, and thank, for you, thank you for your testimony today. Does anybody wish to testify before I gavel out this hearing today? Seeing and hearing none, this hearing stands adjourned.